<laughs> anyway, uh, so so thank you very much again for the invitation to participate in this event. I am obviously very very honored to to share this uh, session with such a distinguished set of prominent uh, speakers. I think uh, by now different presentations before before mine have already covered much ground on the implications of uh, the ongoing technological dis disruption, including its impact on, on financial inclusion and resilience. Um, I think the, the already vast literature on the, on the topic uh, and certainly the presentations in this conference uh, stress uh, this complex interaction of uh, and combination of risk and opportunities that the digital technologies uh, bring to the financial sector. Indeed, I think it is remarkable how digitalization is contributed to enlarge the opportunity set of investors and, and consumers, increase efficiency and competition, the provision of financial services, and importantly, make those services available for larger segments of the population. So the, the significant acceleration you know, of the financial inclusion indicators in the last few years in countries like, uh, say, India and, and China, uh, where digital uh, payments uh, have rocketed, uh, have skyrocketed actually in the recent past, is just one illustration of the power that technology has to make the financial system uh, more able to serve the public uh, interest. The disruption created by technology, uh, the new products and the new providers of financial services, particularly big techs, uh, uh, also poses relevant risks for the achieving for achievement of, of key social objectives such as market integrity, consumer uh, protection, and financial stability. And those are precisely the, the objectives that justify public intervention where markets fail to be, deliver them on, on their own. So the establishment of rules and constraints uh, on market activities such as that performed by new tech players in the market of financial services is the most relevant policy tool to address negative market externalities. That normative uh, action should, however, be uh, subject to the principle of better regulation under which public intervention should, of course, be minimized to what is essential, actually, to preserve social objectives. But sometimes regulation needs to, to face uh, relevant trade-offs as public actions aiming at co constraining and risk and, uh, for uh, adequate market uh, functioning may limit actually the ability by private firms, by tech firms, for instance, to deliver services that could otherwise be socially valuable, for instance, as a result of the positive impact on financial inclusion. So in that context, I think it's important to bear in mind that regulation is not the only form of policy intervention that can help correct market failures. At times, a direct provision of services by government-owned uh, companies may contribute to socially desirable outcomes. In the area of digital payments, uh, for instance, experience in countries like, like India shows how public infrastructures may help society to embrace the benefits of technology and facilitate uh, financial inclusion while avoiding some of the risks posed by an ex ex excessive reliance on uh, large private uh, providers. The introduction of central bank digital currencies, another example of how well-designed uh, public facilities can help optimizing the net benefits of digital payment platforms for the society as a whole. And we just heard uh, Henry uh, also making a, a very, very convincing case about, about that. So some policy, policy strategies aiming at facilitating an orderly uh, adoption of new technologies in the financial sector should therefore incorporate a good combination of, of regulation and the provision of public infrastructure. While other presentations uh, have focused on the, on the latter, I think my job here is to focus very much on, on regulation. In particular, I would like to share a few reflections with you on how the regulatory framework needs to be adapted in order to preserve key social goals, such as, in particular, financial stability. And to be more concrete, I'll uh, focus my remarks on how risk posed by the operation of big techs could be addressed by introducing adequate rules uh, constraining their practices and modus, or modus operandi. So one of the most important uh, recent developments in the financial industry is certainly 
the rapidly expanding participation of large technological companies, our big techs, in the market for different uh, financial services. So we know that the original specialization of big techs were not on financial activities, but on non-financial areas, such as e-commerce and the provision of different types of technological services through internet. However, starting with payment services, several big techs soon became active in the, in the, in the business of wealth management, lending, or insurance. Uh, in some cases also, they offer regular banking services through licensed subsidiaries or through joint ventures with commercial banks. So as it is now well documented, we know that the expansion of, of big techs leverage very much on a very unique business model based on technological and particularly data superiority, which allowed them to benefit very quickly from network externalities. We call this phenomenon in the BIS uh, the DNA loop, D for data and for network externalities, A for, for activities. So use this term that was introduced in the BIS annual economic report corresponding to two, 2019. Big tech services have brought efficiency to the financial industry. This is, uh, this is uh, clear to everyone. Moreover, by, by offering innovative products, they have eroded somehow the historical dominant position of commercial banks in some market segments, such as payments, for which a banking license is not actually required. Moreover, in some jurisdictions, uh, big tests have been able to, to make payment facilities and external funding available to firms and, and households uh, who did not have actually previously access to banking uh, services. But of course, the financial activity of uh, big tests does pose some risks for the preservation of financial stability in particular, which may not always be captured with the, with the, with the, with the current regulatory framework. So let me focus the rest of my presentation precisely on, on that. So uh, those risks posed by the operation of big techs in what respects financial stability come from a few different sources. First is, of course, the direct provision of, uh, to the public of a suite of uh, sensitive financial services, such as payments, credit, or wealth management, and, and sometimes, as I said, deposit taking. So the unsound performance of those activities could contribute to potentially systemic stress due to excessive indebtedness, liquidity mismatches, um, operational discontinuities, and also to facilitate sometimes illegal, illegal activities. Importantly, the, the parallel performance of several of those financial activities alongside the provision of other non-financial services uh, within everything within the same group could exacerbate operational risks and complicate the, uh, their supervision by the competent uh, authorities. Second important source of risk comes from the frequent provision of relevant technological services to regulate the financial institutions. Think about cloud computing services, think about, think about uh, other technological services such as data analytics, for instance. So that actually can lead to uh, large third party dependencies and important operational vulnerabilities. Uh, so recent uh, outages, you, can, you have read that in, in the press, in the, in the technological services provided by big techs typically illustrate that, that those risks can be potentially uh, quite important. In addition, uh, risks uh, can also come um, from the uh, dedication of big techs to promote the, or issue directly uh, new means of payments such as the so-called stable coins. So given the complementarity of those new payment instruments with other services offered by big tech platforms to a large number of users, uh, well, this may have actually the potential to replace fiat currency as a predominant uh, settlement instrument. Uh, and this, of course, could actually challenge the integrity of the payment system, consumer protection, and eventually also monetary uh, sovereignty. And finally, and probably more importantly, I think it's important to bear in mind the potential that big techs have to generate significant concentration dynamics in the provision of key financial services. So network externalities that characterize the big tech business models 
can easily lead to continued increase of their size and their business diversification at the cost of, uh, of at the cost of damaging competitors in an increasing number of related market market segments. And it's important to bear in mind that this concentration is not only important from the point of view of competition of market contestability. It's also important from the point of view of financial stability, as this concentration certainly amplifies the dependence of financial system participants on the services provided just by a few large uh, players. So how regulation has actually reacted so far? Um, certainly, we have seen relevant policy actions in different jurisdictions, certainly following different approaches and certainly different uh, degrees of intensity. So far, in general, uh, authorities are following some, somewhat piecemeal uh, approach, aiming at inserting specific rules in the current regulatory framework in order to contain some of the risks uh, that I have just uh, mentioned. In particular, the provision of, of, of financial services like payments, wealth, management, credit, and right, right, and other than banking or insurance are, are regulated now through an activity-based approach. Uh, so big tech subsidiaries that perform specific regulated activities are subject to the corresponding sectoral requirements, uh, but typically address consumer protection, AML, CFT, and sometimes also operational resilience. In some jurisdictions, authorities are now considering the introduction of a specific regulatory and supervisory regime for large providers of technological services to regulated institutions. That, of, that regime will, of course, affect, in particular, those subsidiaries of big techs that provide uh, this type of services uh, to uh, financial institutions, in particular, cloud, cloud, computing, uh, cloud computing services. However, many of the, of the risks that the activity of big techs generate for the adequate function you know, of financial markets stem from, not, does not stem from specific activities, but from the combination of both financial and non-financial activities that they perform. Uh, their ample array of services are typically anchored on, on shared systems across subsidiaries and on an extensive use of available data from clients obtained throughout all the activities performed by the group. Uh, so risk posed by such interdependencies can hardly be fully addressed by a pure activity by activity regu regulatory, regulatory approach. We have to take into account all those inter interconnections. And this is certainly uh, the case of the prevention of excessive market concentration. For instance, the European Union, the European Commission has put forward a proposal for a digital market act which establishes a, a series of specific requirements which must, must be satisfied by big te tech platforms or gatekeepers, at least as, as, as to use the term used in the, in the DMA itself, uh, aim at preventing and not only prosecuting exposed anti-competitive practices that could lead to the abuse of, mar of market uh, dominance. So special rules on data use, data protection, and data, data sharing obligations with end users and business users are a key component of, of, of the proposed uh, European DMA. But a similar entity-based approach is being already enforced in, in China, following the rules established by the market regulator, uh, SAMAR, and is also the one considered uh, in different legislative initiatives, which are currently under discussion in the US uh, Congress. Moreover, we have seen recently some initiatives for the development of a specific regulation of entities performing services related to stable coins. In particular, uh, a US President's Commission composed of the Treasury and main regulatory agendas has uh, very recently proposed a bold legislative reform that will require issuers of stable coins to become insured depository institutions and establish concrete rules and a supervisory regime for entities providing associated payment services such as uh, custodial wallet uh, providers. Moreover, this report by the Presidential uh, Commission proposes limiting the affiliation of those entities with commercial uh, companies. Of course, if those proposals uh, are finally endorsed by, by US Congress, the scope for big techs to promote and sponsor stablecoins will be 
seriously constrained. By the way, you have read in the news yesterday that apparently uh, Facebook is giving up in the project to develop a global stable coin uh, called DM now. In sum, uh, current uh, developments aim at revising the currently existing activity-based regulation and add a few specific entity-based rules, particularly in the area of competition, to deal with some of the risk posed by big techs. So far, however, uh, there is no ambitious attempt uh, to consider a more comprehensive approach to that could aim at addressing in a consistent manner the risk posed on different policy domains by the combination of activities that big techs perform as implied by their unique business business model. So can we do it better? Well, it's fair to recognize that at present, there are no internationally established regulatory categories or, or standards aiming at addressing the risk posed by the combination of different types of financial and non-financial activities within the same group. Probably the closest reference uh, is uh, the notion of financial conglomerates. So following the publication of the report by the so-called Joint Forum back in 2012, uh, jurisdictions established rules and supervisory practices aiming at strengthening the prudential regime of entities which are active in more than one regulated financial sector, uh, understood as banking, insurance, and securities uh, markets. One specific type of conglomerate rules are licensing frameworks for financial holding companies, FHCs. Those are typically large non-financial companies that hold controlling uh, participations in two or more financial firms that offer regulated uh, financial services across sectoral boundaries and of course exceed some minimum uh, thresholds. So the, uh, this FHC, the financial holding company and the financial institutions it controls make up what we call a financial holding group, which basically conducts financial activities. And indeed, the non-financial activities performed by this by the groups are typically limited to uh, maximum uh, maximum thresholds. In China, the, the central bank, the People's Bank of China, is is now requiring companies that control two or more different types of financial companies, including big techs such as Ant and, and Tencent, to apply for an FHC license. The Chinese regime uh, establishes requirements for the parent FSC company in terms of minimum profitability, financial capacity, and owner's fit and proper conditions. It also promotes uh, sufficiently simple corporate structures and imposes a specific, a specific governance procedures, including the centralized uh, management of all relevant financial risks across uh, different firms within the group. The regime also entails the fulfillment of consolidated capital requirements at the group level and includes constraints on related party transactions and cross subsidiary uh, interaction. So certainly the AF FHC regime goes a long way uh, towards satisfying the quest for a comprehensive uh, entity-based regime for big techs which are active in the market for financial services. That regime, however, the specific regime as it is now uh, designed, may fall a bit short of addressing relevant, relevant risks. So as we have discussed before, challenges posed by big techs uh, for the preservation, for instance, financial stability or more generally adequate market functioning are associated to the combined provision of different types of financial and non-financial services as part of their unique business model. So that entails using common technological and data uh, and data infrastructure for the provision of those different services. So not just for instance that, that, in, uh, that in, in, in some jurisdictions, in particular in Western countries, actually the non-financial activities of big techs are actually more important than their financial, the financial businesses. Therefore, the, the grouping of, of all subsidiaries offering financial services under the same holding company may not be enough actually to control you know traditional risks as well as different forms of data or, or market abuse furthermore uh important to stress that payment services are not uh, explicitly included in the definition of financial holding companies in existing regulatory frameworks so given the crucial role that payment services play 
within the big tech ecosystems, um, and in particular as an enabler uh, for the provision of complementary financial services, a greater focus on payments could be added actually to an eventual reform or revision of the financial holding company regime if we want it to uh, be more effective to achieve actually its, its objectives when applied to large technological uh, groups. In any case, I think the FHC uh, regime seems a quite a useful reference for, a, for policy reflection uh, on how best regulate uh, big techs uh, with the aim of preserving uh, financial stability and other relevant uh, social goals. Uh, yet that, that reflection should consider how this regime could be adapted to cope with the unique business model of big techs and the key role played by their payment infrastructure. So let me let me now finish a uh, few general remarks here. Uh, I think uh, the disruption that technological technology is creating on, on the market of financial services is probably unprecedented. Many people will agree with that statement. It's clear that the new developments are changing dramatically the, way, the very nature of the services offered, the diversity of, of both users and, and providers, and the way the latter, those, those providers actually perform their activities and distribute the products that they, they offer. So in that context, I think that the, the public policy response to such a far-reaching disruption should be commensurate to the magnitude of that disruption. So that entails both the public uh, intervention, direct public intervention to provide the required infrastructure to fully grasp the benefits associated to innovation, as well as an overhaul of the current regulatory framework. But frankly, the current regulatory setup, current normative setup consistent of a series of activity-based requirements accompanied by specific rules for only for traditional financial institutions is simply not fit for, for purpose. In particular, the potential implications of the activities performed by big techs in the market for financial services require the establishment of a consistent set of entity-based rules spanning over different but related uh, policy, policy uh, domains. And for that purpose, we may require first brand new regulatory categories, but also supervisory procedures able to address the challenges posed by big tech's uh, unique business models, including effective mechanisms of coordination among financial data and competition authorities. Of course, the good news is that some relevant policy actions are already taking place in several jurisdictions. What we need now is essentially sufficient ambition, policy impulse, and international cooperation to make those efforts uh, more comprehensive and hopefully, hopefully also consistent at the global, at the global level. So let me stop here. Thank you very much for your attention.